ice except for possibly the main crack and a bunch of little ones. The main crack shows up as black if it's there. If it's snowed, which only gets one inch of precipitation or 10 inches of snow in a year if you're lucky at the North Pole, it's too cold to snow. Right? The sun should be 13 and a half degrees if we go early or 14 degrees above the horizon. That's going to be really important to you if you land out because it's the only way you can tell how to get back. All right? If you're looking at the ice cap, it's really hard to tell how high you are. Your altimeters will work. I'll be, I always look at mine and think, is it frozen? Is it slowing down? But it's really hard to say how high you are. <coughs> if any of you haven't jumped the jet, it, it, it doesn't hurt, but it, it's a real surprise when you go out of there because you go from zero you know, to 150 knots just like that. It's 175 miles an hour. You might tumble. The important thing to remember about the jet, you're going 250 feet a second. Nobody hesitates. It's a very loud horn. The pilot is not going to let us spot. He's going to fly into the wind. They've been flawless so far. Every jump run was dead into the wind because they got the GPS. When the horn goes, I mean, we can have someone looking down. And if the spot looks real reasonable, you've got to exit quickly. I think there's 80 of us. Therefore, I think we'll make four passes of 20. And we'll work that out when we get a chance here. They just told me it may be five hours, it may be 10 hours. I'll make the decision after that jet gets to Shredding Island. Yes? How much time between passes? It takes quite a bit of time between passes in that jet, at minutes? least five minutes, and maybe 10. So you don't want anybody opening above what? It doesn't matter, because it'll be at least five minutes. Even if you open at 5,000 feet, you'll be on the ground before anyone else goes. The jet takes 20 miles to make a pass. It really doesn't matter too much. I want you guys to open at the best altitude to make it to the pole. If that's 10,000 feet, open at 10,000 feet. We don't want to have people walking for five miles. All right? There should be smoke going. And I said the sun is very important. We'll go right to that. You get under canopy and realize you're not going to make it. The first thing you've got to do is realize where you're going to land, where the sun is, and where the North Pole is. Okay. If the sun is here and the North Pole is there, you know that after you land, you're going to walk through the sun to your back the whole time. If the sun is over here, you're going to keep the sun on your left hand side at 90 degrees. Because once you're down there and going, you can't see further than the next pressure ridge. Pressure ridges are pieces of ice that have moved sideways to each other and pushed up large pieces of rock, of ice, I mean. I'll pass these around. You can see pressure ridges. They're all over the place. <laughs> Mary, I'm sitting on one. They're 15 feet tall. They're really hard ice. They're not slippery, and they're very treacherous to cross. And you definitely don't want to be dragged over one. So the rule is, if it's very windy, of course, is to land immediately downwind of a pressure ridge so that you have a long way before the next one. They're rarely closer than 50 yards and can be miles apart. Do you think it's a great picture? I think you took it, as a matter of fact. Yeah, this was my photographer last year. Well, you know, a couple of them. Here's some, uh, some yeah, different po possible polar landscapes. Now, I want you to notice that a pressure ridge is safe to walk on. All right? What you want to look out for is little drops in the snow about this wide and this deep. That's a crack that's opened up. It's usually very small. When we dig down, we find them sometimes microscopic. All right? Sometimes crack open up bigger. This is a picture of a pilot swimming. If you look behind him, that's what you're not going to walk over. On top of the ice cap, this picture will demonstrate there is generally about two feet of compressed ice particles. You can saw it and make like, concrete blocks to make igloos out of it. All right? When a new crack happens as significant, that buckle, and it's got sharp edges, and it's just humped up a little bit. All right? And if you look at it from one side, you'll see it's overhanging open water, and you can't see that from the other side. So what you want to avoid walking over is what this guy just came out of swimming. Looks very different from a pressure ridge. It's very small. It's this pure white stuff. It isn't the blue ice. Now, the blue ice can have snow on it. But you see a big significant pile, it's fine. So if you're walking back two miles, I mean, just keep your eyes open. If you see little depressions in the snow, what you worry about is just little depressions in that. So look at the stuff that you see behind the guy that's swimming and don't walk over that. And don't keep swimming in you're not trying to. Yeah, if you're going to go swimming, you take off your clothes first so you've got something to get back into. In, in that one photo, show an area that you would pick to land. Yeah, well, 
The first time we went to the North Pole, pressure ridges were a mile apart. We had 300 yards to the nearest obstacle. Last year, the pressure ridges were 50 to 75 yards apart and everywhere. You've seen some of the pictures. These pictures represent the first year I went, and it's perfectly beautiful in a group. The second year I went, it was a real mess with pressure ridges. There's a pressure ridge right behind the Santa photo. These are perfectly safe to climb up over, except that they're treacherous and you might fall. You're not going in the water. But if you have to cross a bunch of these, these things can go on, you'll see from the aerial pictures, they can go on for a mile or two or three. Mm. Yeah. There's another piece. This is a piece of cap. This is a profile of the cap. It, it varies between 6 and 18 feet thick, and where it fractures and moves is generally 6 feet thick. Well, there'll be smoke, and what else will be there? There'll be smoke. I'm going to ask them to put up a very tall pole with a flag. They just cut down a tree? No, they've got metal poles. They're taking a lot of stuff in. Uh, you can climb the nearest pressure ridge like you climb the nearest tree and look, but I, I made the mistake of walking out there last year uh, quite a ways, and then when I turned around, I didn't know which way was back. I got lost. And also you can listen for sound. Uh, sound, yeah, sound, sound travels. Sound carries a long way because there was no other humans and nothing. Was yeah, Alex, Alex was about the only guy that wanted to walk with me for distances. We would go out walking because we had three days or so. I thought he knew where we were going. Yeah, but I went out walking by, this is neat, this is neat, and then I turned around and I didn't see anything. We went back and we put up a high pole and we can see that for a couple of miles. All right. But really, your friend is the sun. Something else you might use is the wind. Because we remember, I remember last time I landed a mile short of the pole and the wind was blowing directly toward the pole. And as long as I kept the wind at my back, I was close. The other thing you'll see if you guys are out there is a helicopter will go up, all right, to give you a bearing. If we see people way out there, the helicopter will fly over to you and lead you back. There will be light yeah. rockets shot every the Light rockets while. shot right from the pole. Yeah, we'll make it easy to see. Every half hour, every 15 minutes or so, yeah. you will well, see somebody one. Somebody asked, asked be to have to point out good First, places, good places bad and bad places. places. Well, obviously, good places are pure white with no shadows, OK? Pressure ridge is 15 feet tall. If the sun is at 13 degrees, it casts a shadow for 50 to 100 yards. They're extremely easy to see, blemishes. The snow is squishy. When you step in it, you'll sink in about this much. It doesn't really snow. All right? So you just land, if it's windy, on the back side of a pressure ridge in the biggest, smooth area you can see. It's extremely easy to see. The only caution I want to give you is these pressure ridges, you can't tell how big they are. There, there's some of them pretty little up in nice sharp angles. I would walk around it even if it's a mile. Or I'd go very, very carefully. It might be that there's a lead with this much water and it's that you can hop over it. Or it might be a little bit more. But what can happen is this can be up there, and you can walk on it, and you go right through it. Okay. As we're talking about where you're uh, where you're walking, um, small reminder: once you have landed, you can use the sun as a direction, yeah, the wind saying, yeah. as a direction. You can listen for sound. You will hear the sound of rockets going up. This pop sound you will hear further than you can actually see the rocket. And then you might look for the rocket. You might look for a pole with a flag and for smoke. Yeah. Sound will we'll carry. do all those things. Can we just keep smoke going? We're going to have well, smoke going, but the smoke may the blow very, wind. very low. It depends, on, depends yeah. on the speed of the wind. If there is a mild wind, your smoke will be about three feet, four feet, up to six feet. Well, six feet is not very much because the ice ridges are about 15. 12, 15. What do you anticipate the wind to be? Uh, something between zero and 45. I think that the most we're going to go in is about 30 knots. The wind is extremely smooth. Don't be scared. There's no turbulence. We, what was the wind? 30, 35 knots? It was a really, we had a very strong wind, but absolutely smooth, and this was absolutely not a problem smooth. for anybody who was a square shoot. However, don't make the mistake of thinking, you know, that you're going to land and then break away. I mean, really be spring-loaded, because once you get hit and pulled backwards, the snow starts flying all over you, and you're just blind, you're and being you dragged. I noticed just, I can't see anything. I mean, one second after I landed, I was on my back going 30 miles an hour, and snow blinding me everywhere. The next thing you know is you hit, you hit the, you hit the next pressure ridge. Okay. So, how much you break away? I mean, how long should it be for? You should wait till your feet hit the ground. Okay? But I want you to be think I want you not to be thinking about anything but the breakaway handle after you hit the ground. Immediately. Yes. And also be careful with your toggles. If you break away with a good grip on your toggles, it may take the glove off your hand and you might not find your glove. Okay? I'm sorry for that. Yeah, and you'd be very sorry. The guy I believe lost his hand that had that happen to him. Yep. Okay. He was an old guy at circulation problems, but by the time he got knocked out, he was missing a glove, and it was 20, 30 minutes before anyone got to him. 
His hand was black and it had to be amputated. Since Bill is talking about circulation problems, it brings us to problems in general. So what you might also want to be looking at is you might look out at your neighbor's face and look for white spots. A white spot means that this is a numb area, it's getting frozen. Make sure that you don't see this. And just look out for this. Yeah, the skin turns a, a white. grayish, white, grayish. It becomes hard on the surface and soft underneath. That's the first stage of frostbite, it. and you don't feel a thing. Most experts say do not massage the area. What's happened is ice crystals are formed in the shell, in, in, in the cells on the surface of the skin. Go somewhere where it's warm. Don't touch it, okay? If your eye freezes that shut, if your eye freezes shut, get someone over, cut the eye and blow. You see him doing it there. Because if you tear and the wind blows just right, it'll freeze your eyelashes shut. It's the only way to really unfreeze your eyelashes. It's hard to do it yourself is to have someone cup and blow at your eye. It's kind of annoying when it happens. People are not supposed to use this as an excuse. <laughs> you know? Yeah, come blow in my eye. The girls, the girls get a lot of that. You know. <laughs> you got the mittens that have to too. Excuse me. You can blow and. and yeah, you can also do it. be careful with metallic surfaces that were extremely <laughs> cold. You might be your Don't stick your, your tongue on anything metal. Make sure <laughs> that nothing metallic yeah. comes in contact with your skin. Talk about timing. When do we leave? How long does it take to get there? When do we okay. put our gear on? Right now, they're going to fly the uh, Lucian 74 jet to Shredney Island, which is a third to a half of the way there. Then they're going to get a weather report from the ICE airport, which is 80 kilometers from the pole established. And they've got radio connection with Shredney, and Shredney's got it with us, I believe. They're going to make a decision based on the weather window. If it looks like we have 48 hours of beautiful weather coming, we're going to wait 10 hours before we go. If it looks like we've got maybe 12 hours of beautiful weather coming, we're going to go in five hours. All right? I wish I could tell you that you can go sleep for eight hours, because that's what I want to do. But I think everybody ought to brave the showers and get cleaned up yeah. and, and get you a couple hours nap. Now, there's a restaurant, and I hope Sergey comes and tells me something. Of course, I don't have a list of rooms, and no one's told me about when we're going to get fed. Before Sergey tells us about food, two additional yeah. things. You have a medical problem. Uh, you need help. <coughs> there is somebody that is hurt. There is uh, four doctors with us. Two are German. One is already flying away right now to the North Pole. The other one is a, is a guy that's standing, well, sitting right here. He's going to raise his hand if he's kind enough. OK. All right. And there's two other Russian doctors in blue suits. If you can avoid it, don't go to the blue suits. <laughs> yeah. You'll be sorry right afterwards. <laughs> I'm serious, by the way. Now, Carrie, totally Carrie Elfin back I'm here serious. is a physician's assistant, and she's going to be carrying it from the purple back here. She's going to be carrying some medical supplies. OK. I mean, that down to Lanacane. Also, <clears throat> also, something else. I want to make uh, a point. Uh, really, this is something that I, I want to make sure that you understand well. Once you have landed on the North Pole, do not go wandering off waving flags and taking pictures where your first worry is to come to the area where everybody is and make sure you, that you're noticed, that everybody knows that you're here and that you're fine. Now, before you jump in the plane, make groups of three or four people and ac account for each other. And this way, if one of your four goes missing, then the, miss, the, the missing person will be reported right away. Right away. We cannot have people wandering off. We cannot have people that maybe will have not understood our explanations about sun, wind, rockets, and all the rest, that maybe will land too far. You might be walking to Canada. It's a long distance. There is an icebreaker in June. You might not make it. You might not make it, yeah. There is a lot of white bears, by the way. Yeah, there's not, not a pole. There's a potential. Pole. There's a potential of missing by 10 miles. I've seen it. My point is a hairline crack will cause the top to drop about this far in a very straight line, and it's not dangerous at all. It's when it's dropped about this wide, or it's buckled, that you have to worry about it. Yes? <coughs> which kind of jump are we going to do, and uh, which altitude and how many passes? Well, Sergey has not told me. Do you know the total number of jumpers in our airplane? I do not know. <laughs> I'll find out them before, I'll tell you. We'll have a second <coughs> briefing after this one. We'll Sergey, a... Sergey told me that there was an additional 40 people beyond us, which puts our number at 83. And I believe that we have time for at least four passes <coughs> yesterday. Uh, since we might be going right away, are we going to keep our rooms, or are we still going to get out of our rooms and put our gear in a... Last year, place. we took and put all of our gear in the first room at the end of the Okay, we didn't leave it in the room and they locked it. And uh, leaving your gear here is no problem, you will see. 
Yeah. I don't think that all these little, you see all these little Eskimo kids running around. I think they wanted one room to go. That room is going to look like the jet. All right. If you put anything in that room, make sure that you do not need it again for a long time because it's going to get buried 10 feet tall. So everybody wait and put your bag in the last. <laughs> also, it's a hot tip. Another, yes. Also another Deanne question. is not going to the pool with us. She's staying here in Katanga. Yes, Will she, she is. stay in her room? Yes. They've been told that she is staying in Tanga and Karen Bible. She's my roommate. Can I leave my gear in the room? Yes. And as a matter of fact, having the two girls here to guard the gear is nice. Yes, it is. We'll no. throw our gear in the room. Sergey no, hasn't no, no, told no, no, me no, what no, the no, rules no, are no, this no, year. No, We're no, just no, telling no, you what we no, did no, last no, year. We put all the gear in the last room on the left at the end of the hall. Which is that if we get more than just one room where we don't have to bury everything. <laughs> you know, if you girls want to get friends, you guys want to get friends with these two women and leave stuff in their room, you can't better leave off. that much, how much. How much is the room or for yeah, some pay where you don't have to move the gear if you want to keep your room, even though you're not standing? Uh, I, you know, I didn't understand. I think it was security more than the money. I don't think that they have any other guests except the Germans here. <laughs> you didn't have to book it months in advance? Well, we actually did book months in advance. I, for the life of me, I don't know why this building is here. I really don't. How much, how much are our rooms, though? I have. Uh, still people I, I was told that people who didn't pay the $2,500 expedition fee would pay $70 a day room and board here. So the room is a portion of $70. So Believe me, I, guys, I try, I scream, out, I yell, and they won't tell me we anything. find out how much it is if we want to decide to leave our gear in the room and pay for the room? We already paid for it. We already paid for it. I tried that last year, and I was told, no, nothing is to be left in the rooms. It has to be piled in the other room. And we objected, and they said, Yeah, but if you're paying for the room, who gives a shit? You're paying for it. You're renting it. Yes. I just think they didn't want to be responsible for patrolling all the rooms. Of course, they have... Do we know how big is our landing area, like a quarter of a mile? It's 2,000 <laughs> kilometers across. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest drop zone in the world. <laughs> and, and the nearest, the 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 nearest tree is nearly 3,000 miles. How about the nearest park? The nearest, <laughs> nearest <laughs> park. <laughs> <nearest, laughs> <nearest, laughs> I understand the Germans were going to drop in a Mercedes, so a parked car can be a problem. Uh, I have what? a bad news for you. This is not a Mercedes. <laughs> No one is at the pole yet. The ice airport is established 80 kilometers from the pole. I do not know what the pole looks like. It's something between an absolutely flat thing or a mess of jagged ice, somewhere between. Now, if the pole is on a mess of jagged ice, they're not going to set up the target in the middle of that. All right, the people in the helicopter crew are going to pick the biggest open area as close to the pole as possible. I've got a GPS. If, we, if we're not on the pole and you want to take a hike to the North Pole after we get organized, we'll do it. The North Pole is a matter of opinion. It's a fictitious place. There are over 100 map datums in the world. We're using the National Geodet or the World Geodetic Survey 84 North Pole. That's what I got programmed in my GPS. There's somebody else uh, using another standard so that we have to drop them somewhere. I'm going to live right <laughs> on the pole. So just follow me. All these standards put the North Pole within it. See, the, the Earth isn't round, all right? And the Earth isn't flat. And then it goes up and down. So where the North Pole is is a matter of convention. And the latest one is the World Geodetic Survey 84. And that's what we're going to use. Another small, another small thing. The same thing applies here. If you're trying to leave the hotel for any whatsoever reason, even to go 15 meters away, please tell somebody so people know where you are. You might be needed when you will be leaving really quickly. And if possible, just refrain from you. Just yeah, I really apologize that you can't go sleep together. now. There is nothing, I can tell you. We went sightseeing, there is nothing to see here. <laughs> well, no, the, the, river, the river's nice, but let, let's do it after we get back. What, what floor, is everybody, I shouldn't tell them if the river's nice. Is everybody on a single floor? Is everybody on the second floor? Second, second, second. floor, yes. No one's on anything but the third, second floor. <coughs> well, that's good. So if we knock on all the doors on the second floor, we'll get people. So what's your best guess at how long it's going to be before we I'm not going to guess. I've given up. I'm chilling out. Whatever happens, happens. The next information I want is when we're going to get fed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You already know that. This man's looking on. Yeah. Ten minutes ago. Yeah, right. So so, say something. Someone's got a message. Uh, the, uh, this gentleman here, Mark, Mark came to our names and uh, said that we, we were to we start uh, arriving in the lobby out here. But For what purpose? Oh yes. Okay. All right. 
Now, wait a minute. I, I want to. I want to get an established list. We've got to get an established list of people who are going to the poll. Is anyone missing? Louise. I'll go get her, Bill. As long as you know, we know Louise. She's going to be attached to us. Yeah. Okay. If uh, if the spot is really bad, like you know, like five or six miles or something, how do we get back? Why, if you've missed this, if your spot is bad and you're not going to land, I want you to notice two things. The only guidance you have that's reliable is the sun. All right, the sun is going to go around you in 20.